We know that anxiety is extremely common with hypermobility and with EDS, and anxiety or any other form of fear um, can really help with ramping up that nervous system. So if we can learn tools to calm that down, that can really help a lot. Welcome to this episode of Finding Your Range podcast with me, Jeannie Debon. I'm your host, and I'm joined today with um, our lovely guest. I'm really excited to speak to her, um, Dr. Linda Blue Stein, who's in America. So welcome, Linda. Lovely to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm excited to chat with you. Yes. And um, I'm going to read Linda's um, bio first, um, so many of you might not know um, who, who uh, Dr. Bluenstein is, but she's also known as the Hypermobility MD, so you might have heard of her um, through that way on her social media channels. But um, let me re just read this out and then we'll get started with our questions. So Dr. Bluenstein has been practicing medicine for over 20 years and has helped countless people restore function and improve the quality of their lives. Her special interest in treating performing artists who are at increased risk of hypermobility disorders stems from her many years as a ballet dancer and shattered dreams of turning professional due to her own EDS. An integrative med medicine physician with certification in performing arts medicine, Dr. Bloomstein takes a unique approach to the evaluation and treatment of this highly specialized population. She is an international speaker on the forefront of research on pain, hypermobility and dance medicine. Professional services include individual telemedicine visits as well as workshops and lectures for groups. She received her Doctor of Medicine from the University of California, Los Angeles School of Medicine, followed by the completion of an, I knew I was going to say this wrong, anesthesiology, anesthesiology residency. You got it. <laughs> I, honestly, I've been practicing that, so my apologies. Anesthesiology residency at the Mayo Graduate School of Medicine. She is board certified by the American Board of Anesthesiology. Got it right that time. There we go. So, <laughs> <laughs> ah, thank you so much for joining us um, today. Um, and I'm really interested because you do have this special interest in the um, dancing um, background. But, um, and your bio mentions you used to be a dancer yourself and mm -hmm. that your dreams were shattered because of your own EDS. So could you, are you happy to share a little bit about that, that journey for us? Absolutely. So of course, we did not know it was EDS at the time. But I, the main thing that was happening was I started getting joint pain when I was a teenager and um, actually have a, a picture from the newspaper where I was quoted as talking about dancers' injuries relative to football players and obviously had an interest in that from a very, yeah. very young age. I was 16 at the time and, um, and had asthma and all kinds of other like allergic phenomenon, very, very severe when I was a, a baby even, um, yes. but didn't put any of that together. Some occasional GI stuff, you know, but again, you don't put any of that together until much later. Um, and then started getting migraines and, you know, some, mm -hmm. some of the other things that, that often go along. Right. Yes. And um, it was, it became very apparent though, when I was in, high school that although ballet excuse me although ballet was my my true love i would not be able to perform at a level that that really would be um considered meaningful and successful for me so i decided i needed to come up with a plan b right. and dis and decided to go into medicine then so okay oh so and so what age were you then when you had to change sort of course when I was probably about 17, I was out for a, a really long time. I had a couple of, sur I had several surgeries. I think I had three different surgeries and okay. um, so, and, you know, had to sit out a lot. And I started taking college classes because I was so used to this really compacted schedule. I was bored to tears. <laughs> so I started taking college classes so that I could, you know, get ahead a little bit and, and that's when I realized my body just could not tolerate the, the load that, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I decided I better figure something else out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, but it's such a shame, isn't it? 
you know, and we hear this a lot, don't we, that people were doing right. things, enjoying life, and then all of a sudden these things start to become insurmountable and everything has to change. Um, right. It's one of the most frustrating things, I think, about this condition. Um, yes. How it comes the loss from, is hard. The loss and the sense of grief, you know, yeah. people are grieving, I know. So, yeah. well, thank you for sharing that. Um, so you now work um, in the field, working with dancers and ballet dancers and um, performing artists. So you would think that being hypermobile would be an advantage for being a dancer or a ballet dancer. So what, why, you know, is it an advantage and what sort of problems does this population experience? So it's an advantage until it stops being an advantage, right? So it's, it's an advantage from the standpoint of the aesthetic lines and it is a much more so now than when I was dancing. When I was dancing, yes, you wanted to be flexible and you wanted to have gorgeous lines, but now with social media and the, uh, the prevalence of dance competition and dance competition um, television programs, we are seeing much more of other dancers than we used to. When, when I was growing up, we would see, I saw who was in my own studio. And then yes. when I would go to an audition, I would see dancers from other studios, but otherwise I wasn't, I wasn't bombarded with these images. Yes. So it really has become much more of a worldwide phenomenon of, you know, these dancers that have these lines may get more and more views. They're doing very bendy things on Instagram and getting a lot of attention for that. And, mm -hmm. and so it's very, um, it's very challenging because a lot of times I think other dancers don't necessarily realize that maybe this person, because I do know some of them, um, they they can form these shapes, they can look beautiful, but they can't move because they have so many, they're experiencing so many problems that they're not able to dance in the same way wow. that they look like in the images. Yeah. Yes. That's the joy of social media, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> Just, it always looks good. <laughs> not necessarily the truth. We always show what we want to show, unfortunately. Right, right. So, and so, yes, and you know, people can do these party tricks and things, can't they? Like you're saying, create these amazing shapes and all these things, but they should, it, for healthy tissue, we shouldn't be doing that. that Cor right? Correct. Correct. And what I do is when, when I'm, particularly when I'm doing in-person visits with people um, for the initial assessment, as I'm trying, especially if they do not already have a diagnosis, I am assessing their joint range of motion at different places. And I'll ask them to show me if they have any party tricks and either I will videotape them or I'll have the family videotape them. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then I tell them, save that video, but don't do that anymore. Unless yes. you are in the circus and being paid to do circus tricks. And then, and even then you want to do them very selectively. Yes. And yeah. so you know, obviously, dance, what sort of damage could we, you know, if people persisted in doing those party tricks or, you know, what sort of damage are we looking at? What does it do to us? Right. So that going past the normal range of motion puts strain on the tendons, on the ligaments and, and on things like the labrum, which is the um, nice lining that you have inside your shoulder and your hip. Yeah. Um, and, and so what you can do is cause little bits of micro trauma where the, the tissues are just not as healthy as they were before. And the problem is you don't necessarily know at the time that you're doing the damage. It's like when you're sitting at the beach and you're having a great time and you have no idea that you've overdone it and getting sunburned, right? Yes. Then later on you feel the sunburn. So what, what I try to explain to people is that it's the exact same thing with the ligaments and the tendons because with that sunburn, okay, maybe you might feel a little bit of pain with the sunburn. Same thing with the ligaments and the tendons. Maybe you're going to feel a little something or with the bones, but it's really the long range. So think of it as skin mm -hmm. cancer. Yes. You know, it's, it's accumulative damage of sitting in the sun that, and I love sitting in the sun and, you know, obviously there's huge benefits to that, but we need to be mindful of dose. Yes. What is the yes. dose that we are getting and what potential effects can that have? And it makes a huge difference what our underlying genetics are. Yeah. If we're predisposed towards melanoma, then we need to be much more careful about the sun. If we're predisposed towards 
easy injury and we have poor healing, we need to be much more careful about what kind of range we put our joints through. Mm. That's a great way of explaining it, isn't it? I really like that. It makes it so easy to understand. Yeah, Mm -hmm. very good. I like that a lot. Um, So we sort of touched on it. You know, people obviously have successful careers. Everything's going great. You know, they're, you know, soloists in the ballet. Everything's fantastic. And then they have to give up their careers. So why does that happen? How can we go from being super fit, you know, and then all of a sudden not able to perform at all? How does that happen so quickly? Or is it progressive? Right, right. So I think it's a combination of factors. The most common thing that, that I see is young females that are, you know, they're post pubescent. And once, once they start to go through, uh, you know, their hormonal cycles that can influence joint laxity and they can end up having periods throughout their menstrual cycle that where they are more lax Mm-hmm. maybe start to develop more injury. It may also impact their mast cells, which um, for those that are interested to learn more about that, um, we'll give you some resources at the end, I'm sure. But there, yes. these conditions involve a lot of different things. And so oftentimes when young ladies start to experience their menstrual cycles, they can start to experience some other problems. And so a lot of really incredibly talented pre-professional dancers, females especially, end up not making it to that next level. And, you know, they keep getting injured and start to develop um, persistent pain because as we get more and more injuries, the nervous system is bombarded with signals and the nervous system starts to become more fearful and does not know when to stand down. So it, it kind of is an additive thing. And with males, they have more testosterone, which can be protective. They have more muscle mass. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes they are able to um, tolerate more load, even if they have the same underlying genetics. Mm -hmm. So I have, I would say in my experience, it seems to be that a female is less likely to have a serious underlying connective tissue disorder and be a professional, successful professional dancer. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously it happens, but um, I think a male is more likely to be able to at least do it for a a little while as compared to a female. Yes. Yeah. That's I was just thinking while you were talking. So who are the people who are, you know, going on and having these lengthy careers? They're people with hypermobility, but it's not symptomatic. They're just hypermobile and they can is that, is that what we're saying? Yeah. Right. And it's, and it's really fascinating because now that a lot of people know who I am and know what I'm doing, I get asked to talk to a lot of different dancers who maybe they don't necessarily need um, medical services, but they want mm. to just chat briefly. And it's amazing because some of them, they will be quite hypermobile, but they don't have a history of injuries. Mm. They don't have any family history. They don't mm. have any of these other problems, but then you talk to them and they say, oh, but I know this other person who you're describing to a T, they experience the joint dislocations and the joint subluxations and and these other things. So the, the devil's in the details. Mm -hmm. um, And the, and the underlying question really is why are you hypermobile in the first place? Right. At the end of the day, that's hugely, hugely important. And we know that there are many, many reasons why a person can be hypermobile. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. Really interesting. Thank you. Um, so, so yeah, so you just mentioned people are coming to you and asking for advice. You know, how can the dancers expand the longevity of their careers? You know, are there things, preventative measures we can be doing now to help somebody? Yeah, absolutely. And I always say it's never too early and it's never too late. <laughs> Oh, that's good. (laughs) Because sometimes, you know, I've, I've assessed people in the single digits before. And, and I also work with retired, you know, dancers, circus artists, gymnasts. um, And there are things that you can do at any stage. So if you haven't done anything yet, and you're listening to this podcast, don't worry, it's not too early or too late, just start gathering information and um, there are lots of things that you can do. So the first thing that I recommend that people do is really work on their proprioception. Mm -hmm. So proprioception is knowing where your body is in space without looking. 
And we know that people who have joint hypermobility, it appears that they have an increased risk of having impaired proprioception. So you hear this all the time, that they are very coordinated in class, but then they leave class and they're clumsy and they trip and they fall and they don't know where their feet are and, and that kind of thing. If we can work on our proprioception, then that means that we can also help control our hyperextension and we can make sure that we go into our hyperextended range very selectively. Mm -hmm. So in ballet or well, in any uh, form of dance or other um, sports, you're going to have often a gesture leg and a standing leg. So the standing leg is, of course, the one you're standing on and the gesture leg is the one that's doing the motion. Mm -hmm. The gesture leg, that's okay for that to go into a little bit of the hypermobile range, but the standing leg if you go into the hypermobile range on that, it has it has the weight of your body. So it's much more likely to cause mm. that microtrauma that we, that we talked about and or a joint subluxation. So working on the proprioception, learning to control the hyperextension is very important. There's things that you can do with turnout, which is when you externally rotate at the hip. Mm -hmm. There's things that you can do with your turnout to help control that, that hyperextension. Mm. Also working on um, strengthening Lots of dancers love to stretch, 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 and they love to passively stretch. Um, yeah. I'll give talks and, and look around and everyone is, you know, in the splits and they're just hanging out and they, they might be hanging out on this incredibly hyperextended elbow. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know? um, so it's working on strengthening is very important and it's shocking. I'll give a talk and people come up afterwards and they'll say, well, when you talked about joint dislocation, do you mean like this? And they'll start like popping their shoulder in and out. I'm like, uh, yeah, like that. So stop doing, stop doing that as a okay, trick, yeah. but learn to strengthen the rotator cuff. Because again, the problem is when you're young, you don't, you aren't going to feel that um, pain and you aren't going to realize what's, what's going on in the body. So working on things like strengthening can be very, very helpful. You want to be extremely careful about things like overstretching. So, you know, the whole bit of putting a foot on each chair and then having someone push you down. Oh, in yes. Yeah. Gosh. You can tear your labrum in your hip. You can tear all kinds of, you can tear the ligamentum teres. You can tear all kinds of structures um, when you have somebody do that. And the other thing that I really encourage dancers to do is to learn to listen to your body. You know, mm -hmm. I think they're so used to ignoring pain. You know, being on point is painful. Um, yeah. and, as a, and as a dancer, you are trained to make it look effortless. I mean, you know, up from here up, you have to make it look like it's completely effort, effortless and painless. Wow. So learning to listen to your body is very, very helpful. And of course, I also do recommend the, the, um, the Zebra Club or the Zebra Club um, oh, and your videos you. on YouTube. Because they're, you. they're extremely helpful, yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, this is just fascinating because I've never really, you know, chatted in detail to about dance before. It's fascinating. I think a lot of the information actually is really applicable to our non-dancing community right. as well because it's, right. it's really important. Um, right. When you were, you know, you were talking about having your legs on the chair and someone pushing down on you, is just out of curiosity, really, um, is that to just increase their range further or is it to feel the stretch? Why do people do that? Is that what's... So it, this is not something that I ever experienced as a dancer, but I have plenty of patients that have experienced this. And it, it's shocking, really. And I mm -hmm. think that it is very studio specific. Right. And that's another reason why I really, I love talking to dance parents because choosing where your child goes for dance is mm -hmm. makes all the difference in the world. Because yes. another thing we want to be mindful of is risky choreography. We love exciting choreography. And as an audience, of course, we want to see interesting dance. But as a dancer, you also want to make sure that you peak at the right time. You want to peak at the performance and not beforehand. I've been to performances where none of the original cast is doing the performance because they all have been injured. Oh. And I've been backstage and there's all these people on crutches and in knee. I'm not kidding. It's so we need to be, we need to really be thinking long-term and mm -hmm. how can we help people, you know, perform their best, have their longest possible careers and also 
be able to after dance or after their professional career, semi-professional career, whatever it is, be able to walk without a limp or a cane or, you know, be able to be as active as they want sure. for as long as possible. Absolutely. Wow. That's fascinating. Um, and so what signs should we be on the lookout for? So if I'm a dancer and I'm pushing hard, I'm preparing for a performance, are they, am I going to get little warning signs that maybe things aren't quite right? Well, we know that injury is a very important predictor for future injury. Right. So, so it's really, really important to think about, you know, do I seem to be getting injured more than my counterparts? Um, injury in dance is extremely common. But the question is, you know, how, how were you injured? Was it a traumatic injury um, or was it an overuse type of injury? Mm -hmm. So the first thing I would ask yourself is, you know, do I seem to get injured the average amount or more than my, than my peers? And mm -hmm. the other question is, how long does it take me to heal after I've been injured? Yes. Does it seem like it's taking a lot longer or yeah. does it seem like I, I heal pretty quickly? And again, that's the other challenge is as we get older, we don't heal as quickly as when we're younger. And it's like a brick wall. If we keep taking down the bricks as fast as we're putting them up, we're never going to build the wall. Yeah. So we need to be putting on more bricks more quickly than we're taking them down. So that ratio changes as we get older, the bricks come down faster. <laughs> yes. So. Yeah, yeah, they do. They definitely do. Well, it's so difficult, isn't it? Because it's such a competitive environment and people have to, yes. they do have to train super hard. Um, it must be so frustrating if you're, you know, you're getting injured all the time. It must be mm -hmm. really, really difficult. Yes. Um, yes. Very, very frustrating. Yeah. Um, so just moving away from the dance element for now, um, we mentioned in your bio that you're an integrative medicine physi physician, there's my words again, physician, I don't know what's, <laughs> don't know what's going on today. <laughs> um, how is that different? So what, what, what does that mean, an integrative medicine physician? So there are... I, I trained in a very traditional fashion, as you mentioned, UCLA and Mayo Clinic. Um, and I learned a lot of, you know, uh, medications and different types of therapies. And I practiced as an anesthesiologist in a very traditional environment. But now I incorporate a lot of different types of things in my, in my practice. So I try to be more knowledgeable than maybe some of my counterparts in terms of things like Pilates or the Alexander technique or mm -hmm. the Feldenkrais technique or, mm -hmm. you know, some of these movement therapies, um, gyrotonics, gyrokinesis, yeah. these yeah. kinds of things that, that I, I don't think most pain management physicians especially are really um, very aware of. And, and in integrative medicine, it basically means that you're taking complementary medicine or alternative medicine and incorporating in an evidence-based way. Mm-hmm. The best of, of all worlds. So using East-West medicine, so maybe acupuncture and acupressure and reflexology or, you know, any of these kinds of things, at least considering them and assessing mm -hmm. them and deciding whether or not these are useful tools to incorporate in your practice or, yeah. as, or to recommend to your patients. Yeah, that's great. I really like the sound of that. I think, um, you know, because it's not all about, as we know, just not all about the pills, is it? And um, right. And we know that pills, the opioids don't necessarily work particularly well on sort of chronic pain, for example. We know that. Right. Um, so it's important, isn't it, to look at other, other forms, other ways of working with the body and the mind. So, yeah, I really like that approach. It's nice. And that's, and that's what I found worked for me. It's mm -hmm. not like I really ever planned on doing what I'm doing now. It was a combination of of factors. I, I worked as an anesthesiologist then for many years, and then my EDS caught up with me again, and I was no longer able to practice in the operating room. And through the process of getting myself to feel better, realized, I think I could maybe help other people get better too, mm -hmm. using what I've learned and then attending meetings and things in order to stay up and, and read and, you know, make sure mm -hmm. that I can um, you know treat people in the best possible way yeah oh so gosh so that happened again then with the eds so yes i guess 
So in that line of work, there's a lot of sitting, isn't there? You're, you're in the theatre for long hours, being upright. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> and you have to wear um, a lead apron, which is very, very heavy, puts a lot of extra weight on the spine. That was, um, I, I had a Tarlov cyst, which is a, uh, a cyst in the spinal cord. Yes. And, and I had that and I had very bad sciatica. And eventually I had that Tarlov cyst um, treated and um, surgically uh, treated and, and wrapped Anyway, but the um, but then I also developed a huge cyst inside one of the bones in my wrist, and most people are not aware. But in anesthesia, you know, you're drawing up drugs all day. You're managing an airway, which means you need a lot of strength in your upper extremity. And I had already had major uh, nerve transposition in my elbow, and I've also had a lot of problems with my left shoulder. So then, when the wrist went, it was like, um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, no, yes. But great, great that you, and then I think all, you know, people who have had personal experience and then say, right, this is what worked for me. It's a bit like me with my movement therapy. This right. is what got me out of pain. So I'm going to use this and this passion and, and real self-belief because you know that it works because you've been through it to help right. other people. And I think, you know, sometimes that those are the best kinds of people who can help other people because you've been there. You really mm -hmm. understand it. Yeah, right. very nice. Right. Yeah. So um, when someone comes to see you then with EDS, hypermobility, HSD, um, what's your approach to treating them? What would, what would they expect when they come to see you? Sure. So, so first I want to assess what is going on with that particular person because it's, it's so fascinating. On the surface, everyone looks the same. <laughs> Well, we look like we're very similar, right? But then when you actually dive into the medical history and the specifics for that person in a one-on-one -on -one session, you realize how incredibly different we each are. Yeah. So um, another analogy I like to use is that, you know, if you're on the beach, again, you can tell I love the beach, <laughs> as you get into the water, you know, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. The farther you go, the deeper it gets, the more complicated it gets. So... Yes. So the first thing that I do is um, a, a pretty in-depth assessment. And before COVID, I would spend four to six hours doing an initial assessment with people. Um, wow. but, yeah, but then for a while, my practice was all virtual because of COVID. And now I'm reintroducing the in-person visits, but in a, in a more, um, in a hybrid type of way, I should say. Mm -hmm. And so I want to assess what's going on and what are the biggest challenges that 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 person is facing and then we come up with a comprehensive treatment plan which I which I lay out for them and I explain this is what I think is going on this is what I think that we should do that and make sure that they understand that this is not going to be a quick fix overnight I yeah. try to set them up for realistic expectations that you know if a year from now you're 50 percent improved that's, that's huge because most people have suffered for years before they find me, years, yeah. Yeah. And, and they're just progressively getting worse. And yes. the other thing, as an anesthesiologist, I cared for many, many thousands of people having surgery. And by the end of my career, I would ask people, are you glad you had those other surgeries? Because of course you see their whole history. Mm -hmm. And so I would just you know kind of quickly ask them, there's a lot of surgical procedures that I think if, of course, surgery sometimes is necessary, but especially if you have EDS or HSD, the surgery might not always fix the underlying problem. And so it's mm -hmm. very important to really give it a lot of thought. So another thing that I can help people with is, is making that assessment or at least asking them to really discuss with their surgeon, you know, do you really think this is going to fix the underlying problem and yeah. making sure that they've really had a good movement assessment and that they're really working on those kind of things as well. Yeah, that's so important because, yeah, should always be, well, for anyone, it should be the last resort, shouldn't it? Um, yes. But yes, but with all the issues we have with healing and post-surgery healing, um, really tricky. Mm. Mm -hmm. yes. And of course, yeah, you're talking about having sort of a multidisciplinary approach then and calling on other people to, to find the best solution for that individual. Mm -hmm. yeah. Brilliant. Yes. So... Do you see sort of common issues coming through? I know everyone is different. And like you say, we're, you know, every single one of us has different issues. But are there some common things that you typically see in your patients? 
definitely. So I kind of, again, stumbled upon what I'm doing now because of a series of, of events that I won't go into in any, you know, much more detail, but I, I did write an article for a pain management journal and I sent mm-hmm. it to Pradeep Chopra, um, oh, yes. who is a, is a wonderful mentor to me. Yeah. And I sent him the article and we had a little bit of a email conversation. And then we spoke on the phone multiple times and, and I had asked him how much central sensitization do you see in your patients? And for those who are not familiar with that term, that means that the nervous system is ramped up. The nervous system is basically out looking for threats. Mm -hmm. So a dancer early in their career is going to, in most instances have, you know, they're, they're going to ignore pain often. They're going to keep dancing through it. They're, they're just, you know, they, they have um, that, that desire and they're able to kind of ignore it to a certain extent. But as we get more and more problems, the nervous system starts to become sensitized. And when mm-hmm. I asked him that question, um, I thought he would say it's common or something. And he wrote back, again, we had multiple exchanges. He literally wrote back one word, 100%. Oh, wow. And I thought, that's really interesting. Well, then I opened my practice and, and I would agree. I mean, it, it is it is extremely, extremely common. And this is one of the things that I assess for. So, yeah. so the nervous system is part of the chronic pain picture. So mm-hmm. by working on a lot of the things that you teach with the breathing and learning yeah. to move in a safe way, that can really help to calm the nervous system. Wow. We know that anxiety is extremely common with hypermobility and with EDS and anxiety or any other form of fear um, can really help with ramping up that nervous system. So if we can learn tools to calm that down, that can really help a lot. So um, Mm. I see that central sensitization extremely commonly. I see the anxiety very commonly, um, gastrointestinal problems, um, you know, multiple chemical sensitivities. I mean, you know, multiple allergies, um, pain, of course, in lots of different parts of the body. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, I couldn't agree more with the central sensitization element of it. Um, absolutely. Um, I think I see it pretty much 100%. And yeah, like mm-hmm. you say, this is why, you know, I can't delve straight into exercise with people. I just never would. Because until you've started working on calming down the nervous system and making people feel safe, I think giving them an element of safety, and like you say, with the anxiety as well, it's absolutely essential because otherwise you're just, you know, giving someone some exercise and um, the nervous system is going to be like, wow, what's going on? Like, you know, creating even more red alerts for the nervous system. So dampening down the nervous system, absolutely that's the first step in my opinion absolutely yeah I, I i like the safe the idea of safe versus non-safe that the nervous system is going to either feel safe or not yeah. and that was another surprising finding after i opened my my clinic and realizing how many people had some kind of trauma mm-hmm. associated with their with their clinical picture and that by addressing that yeah. in a you know, a helpful way really can make, help them really make some progress finally. Yes. Yes. Totally. Totally agree. Um, So what are your thoughts on what, obviously we have lots of work to do still, we continue to raise awareness, but what do you think still needs to change in our community for people to maybe have better evaluations, get treatment quicker, even have someone believe what they're saying? Um, you know, any thoughts on that? Right, right. So our healthcare is is such a mess right now. And even people who do not have these complex problems are, I've, I've had recently was dealing with something with a family member and it just is, it, it's shocking to me to see how dysfunctional things are. But I think it's a combination of such short visits Mm-hmm. I think we need more time with our with our physicians. We need longer visits. We need to be able to spend the time. We need to be less reliant on tests and more reliant on that relationship and yes. really right. building that relationship. And, and each person, they need to have a person, somebody that they know believes in them and yeah. cares about them and really will go to bat for them. 
So yeah. I think that's really going to make a, a huge difference. If we can, if we can start to get more people that are aware and, and really want to become involved and if they can it within their clinic structure have some longer visits with people that really have been struggling or at least be checking in a lot more frequently or something mm. i think that would be be helpful absolutely yeah i think you touched on a really important point you know that having somebody at least one person that understands you know i hear that all the time people say it's just so good to talk to someone who actually understands what I'm saying and they're not dismissing me and that's so powerful for somebody's healing isn't it to to be validated by somebody um, it's incredibly powerful and so many people yeah. feel alone and so that's where I love the fact that you're doing this podcast in addition to all the other things that you're doing because people will listen to your podcast people listen I know to, to my podcast and they suddenly don't feel alone yeah they, they all this time they thought they were crazy or you know they believe what other people are telling them that you know because sometimes they are given these messages and and yeah. so suddenly they realize there's a community of other people like me yes absolutely definitely um and you mentioned um your podcast um i'm just we're going to just chat about that bendy bodies well, mm -hmm. you used, used to have, um, used to work on hypermobility happy hour, which I was yep. delighted to attend. Um, but now you're working on bendy bodies. So what's, what's bendy bodies all about? So bendy bodies, I wanted to be able to have very niche episodes for the dancer to help them to really understand this is for you, <laughs> you know, the dancer and other aesthetic athletes. So it could yeah. be skaters, cheerleaders, gymnasts, you know, rhythmic gymnasts, any of those yeah. people. Um, again, because oftentimes they don't realize that there's more to the picture than just the fact that they have these hyperextended joints. Mm -hmm. and so I, I created the podcast because I wanted to be able to work more with the dance community. I wanted to bring the information more to them. And I wanted to be able to have, initially it was going to be some dance specific, like a dance specific series. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer Milner, my co-host, um, started out as a guest co-host for those dance specific series. And then she was doing such a great job. She's now a, a permanent co-host and, and helps with, with all of the medical episodes also. And the audience is anything from dancers and other aesthetic athletes to people who've never done that in their life, but they yeah. find it, you know, obviously listening to a conversation with Ann Maitland, Dr. Ann Maitland is going to be helpful for anyone who yeah. is experiencing these conditions. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had a look, there's a whole range of topics on there, isn't there? Mm -hmm. So much. It's really valuable information. So um, where could our listeners find that? Where would that be? Is that on all the usual channels right it is it's on it's on the usual channels and the best way to uh, find that is if you go to my website there's a page in the top right corner that has all the episodes and descriptions of them and that kind of thing oh fantastic um and just just before we finish off i just wanted if you could help just very quickly um eds and hsd yeah, there's a lot of confusion out there about the difference. Right. And um, so is there an easy way to explain the difference? And is you, would your treatment plan for somebody be different depending on what, what they have? Sure. So I like to get my information as close to the source as possible because there is so much out there now. Yeah. So I will, I will um, borrow from Dr. Alan Hakeem. Mm -hmm. who is um, the, just, as you know, obviously you know him quite well. It's just incredibly well-researched and the chair of education for the EDS Society. Mm -hmm. And he, in a recent um, lecture that I saw, he explained it really well with, with his graphics and showing that HSD is a problem with the musculoskeletal system. And EDS is a problem with the musculoskeletal system and the weak tissues and the skin changes. Ah, okay. So that's quite, that's a nice, easy way of putting it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. Um, so would you treat someone differently? 
So yeah, yeah, usually I don't, to be honest, because at the end of the day, whether they have an HSD diagnosis or an EDS diagnosis, unless they have vascular EDS. Mm -hmm. So we know that EDS has now 14 different subtypes, mm -hmm. depending on the genetic abnormality. And with hypermobile type, we don't know what the genetic abnormality is yet. But whether they have one of the subtypes of EDS or HSD, most of the time they appear to have a lot of the same comorbidities because we know that the comorbidities were taken out of the diagnostic criteria, which I think was a good choice. Um, so basically, I'm still going to treat them in most instances, um, you know, very similarly, if not, if not the same. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the people I see, you know, who have HSD have the same amount, sometimes more pain than people with EDS, you know, they need exactly the same level of support and, and treatment. Um, yes. But it's often kind of I don't know, treat it as like the poor relation a little bit to EDS, but I don't think it is at all. I think people need exactly the same level of treatment um, and support. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you for explaining that. I, I really like that. That's, um, I haven't seen that lecture by um, Dr. Hakeem, but no, that's a nice, easy way of putting it. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. So how can our listeners um, find out more about your services? How could they get in touch with you if they'd like to? Sure. So my website is hypermobilitymd.com. Okay. And then I also am on social media in a variety of places. Um, I'm most active usually on Instagram, but I'm also on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and Pinterest, hardly. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm in all of those places as hypermobilitymd. And okay. Bendy Bodies does also have an Instagram account. And there's also a, a Bendy Bodies um, Facebook page as well. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. So lots of places we can find out more um, and get in touch with Dr. Bloonstein um, if you'd like to. Um, well, thank you so much for answering all the questions today and for your time. I know you're very busy. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, so it's if, great to chat with you. Oh, no, yeah. Very great. I always love talking to you. And um, yeah, it's, it's really nice. Hopefully we can meet up again soon in person. I know. <sighs> Who knows? Maybe soon. Maybe soon. That, that <laughs> I last saw you in Baltimore and uh, we were sitting at a table together yes. at the EBS conference. And yes, little did we know that was going to be a quite a long gap after that. I know. I know. But let's hope maybe next year. Who knows? Right. Right. So one day, Hopefully. one day. Yeah. Um, so thank you again. And um, thank you to all our listeners for joining us today. I hope you found that um, really enjoyable. I loved learning all about the dance elements of that. And um, any dancers, um, feel free to leave some comments or non-dancers, feel free to leave some comments <laughs> down below. Um, and as I say, you can get in touch directly as well through those channels if you would like to. So thank you for listening and until next time, keep moving.